Good day and welcome to Living Words, Scripture and Tradition, brought to you by the Catholic Diocese of Biloxi. I'm Father Joe Delatuso, your host. As you know, if you've been with me for the past two times, we've had with us Father Austin Walsh, who during this Lenten time is going through the Passion narratives, looking at them from a historical, critical perspective. The last time we were together, we went through the first half of the Passion Narrative according to Mark's Gospel. I'm very happy to have Father Austin Walsh back with us so that he continue through and finish up this passage and we'll continue on then for the next four weeks, a total of six weeks, at looking at all of the Gospel passages on the narratives on the Passion Narratives. Austin, real good to have you back again. Good to be back again, Joe. Okay. Good afternoon again, and now we're going to continue with the Passion Narrative according to Mark. I just want to uh, make a few points before we get into it again. Remember I mentioned that Mark's community was being persecuted by Nero, or shortly uh, had been persecuted by Nero, and therefore they were feeling that very human sense of abandonment by God, by fellow Christians who might have turned them in even, so Mark is going to, or the author of Mark's Gospel is going to uh, try to be a consolation to them by showing the abandonment of Jesus. In the Garden of Gethsemane, I wanted to point out, and I had forgotten before, and then we moved into the trial, but remember when Judas says, I will show you who he is by kissing him. Now, in other accounts, Jesus says something to Judas when he kisses him, but he doesn't say anything in Mark at all. Because for Mark, silence equals resignation and abandonment. When the person cuts off the ear of the high priest's a servant, uh, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says something. In Mark's Gospel, he says nothing. Again, marking resignation. But also, it points out what, what I've been saying for two weeks. We don't have historical accounts here. We're having theology, faith. So Mark's emphasis is going to be on abandonment, and for him, silence equals abandonment, and therefore Jesus says nothing when Judas kisses him, and he says nothing when the man cuts off the uh, ear of the servant. Uh, Matthew has him saying something in both instances. Uh, what's the historical truth? Well, that's not the important thing. The important thing is the theological truth. And again, Mark's theological emphasis is if Jesus was the master and is the master and was so abandoned, then we, his disciples, should also expect abandonment. And I mentioned last week that if we do not experience in some way abandonment or rejection, then maybe we're not really preaching the gospel. Maybe we're not living the gospel. Uh, maybe we're really not that different. And I think that's something we have to look into. Now, I don't say that we have to be different for the sake of being different. Uh, Christians realize that they are part of this world. They find the Lord in the world. Uh, they don't make an end run around the world to get holy. We get holy by being more human by uh, responding to the spirit that lives in the world. Uh, but at the same time, there were certain aspects of the world that we can't buy into. And uh, sometimes we do. Sometimes we, we live a life that doesn't really say that we are disciples. And each one of us in his or her heart has to ask, uh, am I really living the discipleship? Last week, we ended by reading the uh, account of Jesus before the Sanhedrin. And this is the Jewish court, and how he, of course, is falsely accused and the, uh, uh, forced to tell them that he, does, he is the Son of God, and therefore he is accused of blasphemy. That's one of the night episodes going on. The other night episode going on is Peter in the courtyard, and we like to contrast how Jesus is acting with how Peter is acting. So let's read that part of the text in uh, St. Mark. That would be chapter 14, verses 66 to 72. And I am using the New Jerusalem Bible translation. While Peter was down below in the courtyard, one of the high priest's servant girls came up to him. 
She saw Peter warming himself there, looking closely at him and said, You too were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it. I do not know. I do not understand what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the forecourt and the cock crowed. The servant girl saw him and again started telling the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. A little later the bystanders themselves said to Peter, You are certainly one of them. Why, you are a Galilean. But he started cursing and swearing, I do not know the man you speak of. And at once the cock crowed for the second time, and Peter recalled what Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will have denied me three times. And he burst into tears. What a contrast. Here you have Jesus before the Sanhedrin. These, th these two episodes are probably going on simultaneously. Uh, Jesus being mocked because he claims to be a prophet, and meanwhile his prophecy about Peter is coming tr true at the same time. So the irony of it is that the master confesses and the disciple denies. First of all, he denies he's a disciple, and then he denies he even knows Jesus. And he even curses when he says that. And if uh, the scripture scholars are right, and many of them feel that Peter cursed Jesus so that you really, he has really reached the depths of degradation, of denial. He not only denies Jesus, he denies he's a disciple, he disowns Jesus and even curses him in order to save his own skin. You see, Mark is not going to paint a pretty picture of even the Peter who is the head of the church. Peter denies. And now, Mark has a reason for this. Because at the time he's writing, there are many people who are dying rather than denying Jesus. And there are people who might have denied Jesus to the authorities in Nero's time who will receive consolation that they can repent as Peter does because he's very careful to add and Peter wept to show Peter's repentance so that Peter becomes an example to others who might have apostatized, who might have denied Jesus and what Mark is saying or the author Mark is saying is just as the head of the church denied don't feel too badly if you did, but do what he did, though. Repent and affirm Jesus. So uh, it's an ironic situation that uh, the head of the church is put up as an example of someone who betrayed Jesus, and there were many lesser folks in the church who do not betray Jesus. And yet those who do receive inspiration from Peter because they too weep and they do too repent. So it's an interesting contrast. Okay, and I think when you, you put them both in uh, the two uh, episodes side by side, uh, you see how the master acts and how the disciple acts. Again, let's make that contemporary. Uh, do we uh, act like Peter? We say, isn't that awful? Peter denied Jesus. Peter betrayed him. Uh, it's always so much easier to sit in our soft chairs and... Uh, look back on this point and not appreciate Peter's fear. He's afraid. Uh, just as Jesus is afraid to die, Peter's afraid to die. Uh, but Jesus faces the truth. Jesus lives the truth. Jesus is the truth. We know that since the resurrection. Uh, but many times we betray. Every time we opt for a non-gospel stance, uh, we betray. We don't have to stand up with clenched fists and say, I deny Jesus. I mean, very few of us would do that. We'd be afraid of a lightning bolt or something, but we wouldn't do that. But we do deny subtly, surreptitiously, unconsciously maybe. But every time we choose hatred over love, we deny Jesus. Every time we choose violence over love, we deny Jesus. Every time we opt for racism over brotherhood and sisterhood, we deny Jesus. Every time we think that right, might makes right, and say that love has no place in this world, if might makes right, 
there is no love, then we deny Jesus. So I, I think that we have to really get into these episodes and see ourselves. And maybe we have not denied Jesus in the big thing. But maybe we do deny him in the little things. Or maybe there's a gradual whittling away of our commitment as disciples by our over-compromising with some of the values of this world. And we wake up someday thinking like the world thinks and not as a disciple should think. So let's be uh, understanding of Peter uh, because we certainly hope the Lord's going to be understanding of us. Okay, let's go on with this narrative then. In chapter 15, in Mark's Gospel, G Jesus is now brought before Pilate. I explained last week that the Jewish people, the Jewish leaders, could accuse someone of a crime and even uh, offer the death sentence. But they had to have that death sentence confirmed and carried through by the Roman authorities. And that was a political situation. That's why he sent the pilot, even though Ma uh, Mark doesn't describe that. Uh, un uh, I mean, uh, give us a reason for that, nor does Luke or Matthew. John's the only one that explains why that's happening. So we read, first thing in the morning, the chief priests, together with the elders and the scribes and the rest of the Sanhedrin, had them uh, their plan ready. They had Jesus bound and took him away and handed him over to Pilate. Now, we don't know if this is a second meeting or this is the end of the all-night meeting. There's no way of knowing that. A Pilate put to him this question. Are you the king of the Jews? He replied, it is you who say it. And the chief priest brought many accusations against him. Pilate questioned him again. Have you no reply at all? See how many accusations they are bringing against you. But to Pilate's surprise, Jesus made no further reply. Again, silence equals resignation with a sense of abandonment. Pilate, unlike the Jewish leaders, is not interested in the religious question. Are you uh, a messiah? Are you uh, the one they're expecting? He's more interested in the political question are you the king of the Jews? In other words, are you going to pose a threat for the political structure? Are you going to threaten the status quo? And even though Jesus knows he is king, replies, no, says nothing. And this is also true in contemporary situation. As long as we don't pose a threat to those who are in authority, they leave us alone. As long as we keep religion in the sacristy, in the church, in the closet someplace, that's fine. But as soon as we begin to express the implications of the gospel publicly and challenge situations that are not gospel, we become a thorn in the side of authority. So they expect us to oppose them on things dealing with sex, you know, pornography and uh, things like that. They expect that, and we should. Um, but when it gets down to things like social justice, peace, uh, better wages and uh, better working hours for people, uh, more just wages being given, then they accuse us of getting involved in politics. So we can play it safe and just talk about religious things and they'll say, yes, we'll listen to you. This is a free country. But as soon as we start living out the implications of a lived gospel, then we become a threat. And they're not going to like that. So Jesus is not a threat to Pilate right now because he's not saying whether he's a king or not. And Pilate knows down deep that Jesus is no political threat. He knows that. We read, at festival time, Pilate used to release a prisoner for them and one they asked for. Now a man called Barabbas was then in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the uprising. When the crowd went up and began to ask Pilate the customary favor, Pilate answered them, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he re realized it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over. 
The chief priests, however, had incited the crowd to demand that he should release Barabbas for them instead. Then Pilate spoke again. But in that case, what am I to do with the man you call king of the Jews? And they shouted back, crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate asked him, what harm has he done? But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. So Pilate, anxious to placate the crowd, released Barabbas and for them, for them, and after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Pilate goes down in history as the coward. He knew Jesus wasn't guilty, but he didn't want another uprising on his hand. He is willing to let this accused felon out to please the leaders of the Jews and hand over a guilty person. Again, that's the way of politics in many ways. We can't expect um, truth all the time because it's always compromise. It's the art of compromise. And maybe that's the way it has to be, the art of compromise. But the gospel can't be compromised. The gospel is a search and a hunger for the truth. And Pilate doesn't live the truth. He abandons Jesus into the hands. But again, just as there was a gratuitous humiliation of Jesus in the trial of the Sanhedrin, when they spit on him and slapped him, now there's a gratuitous humiliation after the political trial. The soldiers led him away to the inner part of the palace, that is the praetorium, and called the whole cohort together. They dressed him up in purple, twisted some thorns into a crown, and put it on him. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his head with a reed and spat on him, and they went down on their knees to do him homage. And when they had finished making fun of him, they took off the purple and dressed him in his own clothes. In the Sanhedrin trial, they spit on him and slap him and make fun of him because he claims to be a prophet. In the political trial, they crown him with thorns and they put a purple cloak on him, which is the sign of royalty, and make fun of him because he claims to be a king. So Jesus is humiliated by the religious uh, establishment and also by the political establishment of his day. Now, the crucifixion. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he refused it. Then they crucified him and shared his clothing, casting lots to decide what each should get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The inscription giving the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And they crucified two bandits with him, one on his right and one on his left. The passers-by jeered at him. They shook their heads and said, Aha, so you would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Then save yourself, come down from the cross. The chief priests and the scribes mocked him among themselves in the same way with the words, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now for, for us to see it and believe. Even those who were crucified with him taunted him. So Jesus is again humiliated. Now we begin to see Mark's playing around with numbers, threes. He arranges things in threes. Jesus went to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane three times. Um, now we see he divides it between the ninth hour, uh, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and the, and, in the afternoon. So that it goes from nine to twelve, twelve to three, and in the, those three hours, three episodes happen. Three groups of people mock him. And they mock him for the very things that the trial was about. They mock him for saying he was going to destroy the temple in three days and raise it up. They mock him for being king of the Jews. Okay? And they mock him for king. I mean for a prophet. Now even uh, the, the thieves next to him mock him. Now we, we notice, I mentioned earlier, that the two thieves mock him. In Luke's Gospel, one of them asks, forgiveness. Now, what happened? 
were there two thieves with Jesus? Did both mock him? Did one mock him? The other ask for forgiveness? That's not the point. The point is not history again. The point is theology. Mark is here showing total abandonment. Even the criminals mock him. Now, how abandoned can you get? So that there is no support. There's no visible sign of support on the part of Jesus. So, even though he uh, provides the shortest account of the crucifixion. He makes every detail count. And that's why his artistry is most apparent in his resort to organizing pattern of threes, as I mentioned. And he uses that effectively. Now, if no human being shows Jesus sympathy in the first three-hour period, see, that's what he's talking about, the first three-hour period, the second three-hour period, 12 to 3, Nature itself becomes dark and gloomy. The whole account. So let's read that account because it's interesting. When the sixth hour came, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those stood by heard this, they said, listen, he is calling on Elijah. Someone ran and soaked a sponge in vinegar and putting it on a reed gave it him to drink. Wait and see if Elijah will come to take him down. But Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The centurion who was standing in front of him had seen how he had died and said, in truth, this man was the Son of God. So in the first three hours, the human groups, uh, the priests, the passers-by, the criminals, mock Jesus. The second three hours, nature itself mocks him. It becomes gloomy and dark and stormy. And this has to give Jesus the feeling that God has abandoned him. And he even says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He doesn't say my father. He says, my God, why have you abandoned me? And so the starkness of Mark's account is brought home even by the only words that Jesus says from the cross. He says no others. He doesn't say, I'm thirsty. He doesn't say, Father, forgive them, for they know what they do, they're, they're doing. Or, Son, behold your mother, Mo mother, behold your son. Again, pointing out, if, as I'm sure I'm doing this, to the point of boredom, and that is, it, this is not his history. This is theology. So, Mark is saying, of course, the historical fact that Jesus is crucified, but what is the theological and spiritual significance? And Mark is saying the significance is abandonment. And that we have to learn what it means. So the Father does respond, though, in Mark's theology. And that is this. The curtain of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. And that is, according to Mark's theology, the Father saying, no longer does worship take place in that temple or any temple made by human hands, that now true temple, a, tr a true worship, will take place in spirit and truth, and my son is the center of that worship. He's the new temple. And by implication, all of those who become disciples of Jesus Christ become the living temple of God. And so the torn curtain says that. Also, for the first time in the gospel, a human being and not a believer, a Gentile soldier, recognizes Jesus as God's son. And that is the victory of Jesus, very subtly given in Mark. But the victory and the hope is that the Father has now said by the symbol of the torn curtain, 
that my son now is the center of worship and that he will be known not only to his own, but to even to the Gentiles. So, abandoned by his disciples, betrayed by Judas, <clears throat> denied by Peter, rejected in favor of a murderer by the crowd, mocked by the Sanhedrin and the Roman God, and by all who came to the cross, surrounded by darkness, and seemingly abandoned by God, Jesus conquers. In this one dramatic moment, Jesus is vindicated by the Father. God has answered Jesus' prayer, and he will deliver him. Now, Mark's theological outlook in his whole gospel is this, that people can believe and become true disciples only through suffering symbolized by the cross. Salvation comes only through acceptance of the cross. Now that's an aspect of Christianity that we cannot forget. And as I mentioned in the first program, it's not a call to masochism. It's a call to generosity. It's a call to service. It's a call to thinking of others. It's a call to an abandonment of the philosophy of looking out for number one. And that's dying. And I cannot be a disciple if the clothes I wear and the car I drive and the house I live in and the clubs I belong to and the schools I send my children to are more important than discipleship, are more important than Jesus Christ. You see, Mark reminds us Christians of the latter part of the 20th century, of what he reminded the Christians of his own community of, that there cannot be a crown without a cross. And there cannot be Christianity without the crucifix, without the cross, without dying. And so each of us is called to this dying. Each of us is called to this abandonment of those aspects of life and those aspects of the world that are contradiction to God and his gospel and his son. And so as Lent continues, Meditate on this very stark reading of Mark. God bless you and join us next week when we'll discuss Matthew. Goodbye. Your comments and suggestions concerning this program or topics for future programs would be greatly appreciated. Mail your comments to Living Words, Post Office Box 1189, Biloxi, Mississippi 39533.